we're going to calculate the market value capital structure for Alcoa stock and that means we're going to calculate the percent of common stock that is in Alcoa's capital structure, the percent of preferred stock, and the percent of debt in Alcoa's capital structure. Now let's do the easy part first that would be common stock. Uh, the easiest place to find common stock information for me is finance.yahoo.com put in Alcoa's ticker symbol AA and we notice that Alcoa is trading for eight dollars and eighty-eight cents a share. Well let's put that in. Now we need Alcoa's shares outstanding. Easiest place to find that is to stay on that same quote. Scroll down to Key Statistics. Click on Key Statistics. And you scroll down and it's actually over to the right under Trading Information and you'll notice that we have shares outstanding 1.07 billion shares outstanding so we're going to put in that 1070123123 zeros and we would like to have some commas in there to make sure that we actually have the right number of of shares there but yes that is 1.07 billion shares and now we'll just multiply the shares outstanding times the share price to get a market value of stock of 9.5 billion dollars. Now moving on to Alcoa's preferred stock. Alcoa's preferred stock ticker symbol on finance.yahoo.com is AA underscore P. And not all stocks have preferred stock by the way. As a matter of fact it's fairly rare nowadays. In this case, Alcoa's preferred stock is trading for 90 bucks a share, and this is preferred stock which pays $3.75 per share every year. It's a fixed, uh, it's a fixed um, dividend every year. So 90 bucks a share. Let's go ahead and enter that. $90 per share. Now we need shares outstanding, and this is a little bit more difficult to come by. Uh, in order to get shares outstanding, we're actually going to have to go to Alcoa's 10K annual report form. So let's go back to Alcoa's quote, which was AA. Scroll on down to their company SEC filings. This is typically not available on their balance sheet exactly. So let's scroll down to their SEC filings and scroll on down to annual report, the full thing. We're going to get it, and it might take us a minute for this to load up on my computer because it's got a large data set that it pulls down. And what we're going to want is the Form 10K, every bit of it. So let's go ahead and click on Form 10K and, and be a little patient because it takes a little while. Notice down there it says at the bottom transferring data from Yahoo Brands. It's going to take a little while to pull this whole form down and if I do it too quickly Mozilla is going to hang up on me. So let's just wait a second here. Now the reason that you have to go to the to the 10K is because it's the the number of shares outstanding is typically not available on the publicly available well on the publicly displayed information for balance sheets. Uh, you actually have to go to the 10K. Now that it's done this, we're going to search and control F in Mozilla opens up a little search window and we type in the word preferred and notice that it searches for it and we have some information here. If I'll make this a little bit bigger so that you can see. And it says right here, there are several, several places this information is here. It says as of December 31st there were, let's scroll down one more, 1 billion shares and 546,000 shares respectively of common and preferred stock. So it's the 546,000 shares of preferred stock that we care about. So 546,024 is the number of sh preferred shares. And so that gives us a market value of number of shares outstanding times the price of only for, well, let's see how many it is, only $49 million. So it's very small relative to the size of the of this common stock. Now what we want to do is find short-term and long-term debt. Now the nice thing about short-term debt is that for the most part, short-term debt 
trades at par unless the company is in some sort of horrible financial distress. And so we're going to use the book value of short-term debt as a good proxy for the market value of short-term debt. But we got to find that from the financial statements. So let's go on back to finance.yahoo.com. This is Alcoa's quote. And if we scroll on down from Alcoa's quote to balance sheet, click on balance sheet and look at it. We get down to the liabilities side. We'll notice that there is, let's see if I can get all of this on the same page. First off, we've got December 30th, 2011. The information, this is February 2013. 13. So this is a good, this is pretty old, uh, February 20th, 2013 when I'm doing this. Uh, the information from December 30th, 2012 actually is not going to be available for another, for another month. So you know what we're going to do? Let's go to quarterly data. We'd like as most recent data as we possibly can. If we go to quarterly data, at least we'll be able to look at September 29th, 2012 data. So we'll use that for our, uh, for our market value. It would be really nice to have the December 30th information, but it's just simply not available yet. Currently, as of September 29th, we have 1.174 million, 1 million, well this is actually in thousands, so this is 1.174 billion dollars in short term or the current portion of long term debt. So this is all debt that's maturing within a year. So 1174 is the amount for short term debt, the book value. 1174 and then three zeros and then three more zeros. Let's see if I've got the right number of zeros here by formatting that as a comma. Yes, all right. So 1,174 million dollars worth of book value of short term debt. Now let's look at the book value of long-term debt, and we'll talk about that in just a second here. Go down to long-term debt. We have well, $8,350,000 in long-term debt. $8,350,000 book value of long-term debt. That's at $8,350. And again, let's make sure putting commas in here that we have the right number of zeros. Yes, $8,350,000 worth of long-term debt. Now, the problem with just using that number as the value of long-term debt is that is only the maturity value. All that is is the face value of the debt. But if interest rates have changed substantially since Alcoa issued that debt, then the market values of those bonds will be different from their face values. If interest rates have declined since those bonds were issued, the market values will be higher than their book values. If interest rates have increased over time, then the market values will be lower than their book values. And so we need to look that up. And one of, again, the easier places to look this up, again, is on Yahoo, but we'll do it on finance.yahoo.com slash bonds and actually I've got that over here on this tab finance.yahoo.com slash bonds and we're going to search for Alcoa and when we look at and I'm sorry these are kind of small I can't really make it too much bigger for you to be able to see I can make it a little bit bigger if you look at these, you'll notice that Alcoa has at least on this site one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different bonds. And let's go ahead and sort them by maturity. They have some relatively shorter maturity bonds, which mature in only about four years, up to bonds which mature all the way out in February 2037. But the important thing to note is that all of these bonds, with the exception of the ones that are maturing in April 2021, all of the other bonds are trading at a premium. What that means is interest rates have declined since these bonds were originally issued. Notice, for example, this bond, the February, the July 2018 bond, is a 6.75% coupon bond. Uh, it happens to be yielding 4.924% because interest rates are very low right now. And so consequently, it's trading above par, trading at 110% of par. One way to get a handle on how much above par on average you're expecting 
Alcoa's bonds to trade is, and this is sort of a quick and dirty way to do it, but it's frequently this is, is sufficient, is to just find the average premium that all of their long-term debt is trading at. So I'm just going to copy this section directly into Excel, and I'll put it on a different sheet so I can do the calculations over here without interfering with my without interfering with my um, other calculations. We'll make these make this stuff a little bit bigger. And what you notice is all of these prices, 107, 110, 102, 102, all of those, let's just average them. If we just average those, we notice that on average these things are trading at 102.626 or, or about a 2% premium over their book value. Okay, well that's Really, that's actually close enough to par value so that you could just use the book value of the long-term debt. But since we're doing this as an exercise, let's go ahead and use this number as a, as a premium. So uh, 102.626, we'll go ahead and use that as the um, premium. We'll type that number in here. And so that means that the approximate market value of our long-term debt is going to be the eight billion dollars market value book value that it is times the average premium meaning the average price of these bonds and that would be uh, 102 percent now we do in fact need to divide by 100 in order to normalize that 102 and that gives us 8.569 billion dollars for long-term debt now, just in case these your bonds that you're looking for don't show up on bonds.yahoo.com, well, finance.yahoo.com slash bonds, let me show you one other place to find bond information. And that would be at www.finra.org. Go to www.finra.org, click on investors, click on under market data click on bonds under bond type click on corporate and click on AA for Alcoa so you don't type in the word Alcoa you type in the symbol of the ticker symbol for the stock and either press enter or search and you can get the same information actually usually better information on FINRA than you get on bonds.finance.yahoo.com slash bonds. As a matter of fact, we only found eight bonds on the F Yahoo site. This is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve bonds, and they do have an awful lot more information on the individual bonds here. For example, you can click on any one of these bonds, say this uh, 2019 bond here, and it will give you lot of information about it. It'll give you the original uh, when it was, let's see, when it was issued, the coupon rate, it gives you information about uh, how much was originally issued, the face value. Uh, this thing had 750 million dollars originally issued. Uh, almost none of it has been retired. There's 749 million dollars still uh, outstanding for that bond issue. Tons of interesting information here on the FINRA.org site, but we don't need that for this calculation right now. All right, so now all we need to know is the total value of capital. All right, so the total value of all the capital is going to be, well, let's actually, let's go ahead and put, uh, let's go ahead and just do debt, lump debt all in together. So total value of debt, that will be the short-term debt, and the long-term debt. Sometimes people like to uh, do, when they're doing a market value capital structure, have stock, common stock, preferred stock, short-term debt, and long-term debt as separate ones. You don't always need to do it that way. You can. We're going to just do total, total debt this time, just for this example. Uh, and so the total value, value of all the capital is the stock, 9.5 billion and the preferred stock only 49 million and the total debt let's make that a little wider and so percent common is going to be just the market value of the common divided by the total so 49 percent 
percent preferred is just going to be the market value of the preferred divided by the total amount. We'll make that a percent. And finally the percent debt is going to be the total value of all the debt divided by the total amount which in this case Alcoa's got quite a bit of debt. It's, uh, it's a little bit more debt than it is common stock. So we have 49 percent common, 0.25 percent, uh, one quarter of a percent preferred, and 50 percent of debt. If we had wanted to we could have split debt up into short-term debt and long-term debt and use those separately.